the Messenger of Allah predicted many things. And remember, Ya Ibad Allah, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was only speaking through revelation. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُحَىٰ It was nothing but a revelation. One of the most profound hadith is a hadith al-wahd. When he was saying this hadith, it seems as though he was looking at the condition of the ummah today. He said it's about to happen that the nation when it invites one another on you. On the ummah, when the West or Europeans, when they decided to deal with the world, they came to the conclusion and they realized every dynasty, every empire, it has to come to decline at one point. So they study in the UK and they said, and this is when the United Kingdom was ruling the world. So they said, how do we do this? We have witnessed the Persian Empire. We have witnessed the Roman Empire. We have witnessed the Muslim Empire. We have witnessed the Mongol Empire. We witnessed empire coming up and going down. What should we do? So they decided three things. They divided the world into three categories. The white, the yellow, and green. So they decided to say when it comes to white, the legacy of power and authority has to rotate. What does it mean? It means if the United Kingdom can no longer continue carrying this message, carrying this superiority, carrying this authority over the world, then this next person must be a white person. So if the UK cannot do it, the France has to pick up. If France cannot do it, the Americans have to pick up. The second part, they say the yellow world, which means the Asian, mainly Chinese, Indians, and everybody else from Asia. They say we deal with mutual exchange. We give and take from them. But when it comes to Muslim world, Middle East and Africa, the green world, the rich world, the world full of resources, when it comes to that, then we have to divide them. You know, the nation, the messenger of Allah said, we we'll call each other. As a people, we we'll call each other to a feast. Number one, we got to divide it into small portions. I'm from Somalia. Look what they did to us. They invited themselves to Somalia and they said, this part is colonized by the French. So you no longer Somali. You are called Djibouti. They came to my part of the world and they said, you're no longer part of Somalia. You're British Somali. You're no longer part of your nation. They went to the south and they said, you are Italian, you're no longer Somali. They took another part and they gave to Kenya and they said, you're no longer a Somali Muslim, you are Kenyan. They took the fifth part and they said, you're no longer Somali Muslim, you are Ethiopian. So one of the things is to make sure that the Muslim nations are divided into small segments. I went to a remote area that was hit by the drought in Kenya. And the first thing that I saw when we landed, I saw a building on the top of the mountain. Beautiful building. I said to the brothers, before we go, I want to see what is it. What's that building on the top of the city in a place called Marsabet. So we went. It was a massive church that was established in 1926. Immediately after the Khilaf al Islamiya was destroyed, they went to the end of East Africa to establish a church. And I went and I saw nations, I saw people, communities, whom their third last name or second last name is Abdul Rahman or Abdullah or Muhammad or Umar or Ali. But the first name is Christian and the second name is Christian. So they came to these Muslims, they killed their scholars, they destroyed their tradition and legacy, and they took their children to school and turned them into Christians. I went to South Africa and the Shiu I was with, they said, you know, we need to go to the washrooms, you know, before we proceed. I waited outside. A young man saw me standing with a thobe and kufi. And he came and he just is, you know, young, young African man. And he came and he said, where can I get this? The thing that you're wearing. I said, why would you want to wear one of my outfits? He said, because my grandfather, every other night, he comes to me wearing this in a mountain when everybody's wearing white. And he's saying, my son, join us. So I said, are you Muslim? He said, no. Is your father Muslim? He said, no. I said, was your grandfather Muslim? And he looked down. 
with a sad face and he said, yes, but I don't know anything about him. I said, what was he doing in your dream? He said, with his, his, a lot of other people, they were climbing up a mountain, all wearing white, but different, little bit different of this. So I took my phone and I Googled Arafah, the day of Arafah, and I showed it to him. And he, wallahi ya ikhwa, he cried. He said, how did you know where my dream was? I said, your grandfather is not asking you to buy a thawb. Your grandfather is inviting you to Islam. Repeat after me, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. This is what they did as far as South Africa, where we as Muslims rule once upon a time. As people invite one another on the feast. Now, why did the Messenger of Allah use food as an example? Because food, when you're eating and consuming, when you're devouring food, food does not challenge you. Food does not resist you. You grab that piece of chicken and you put it into your mouth and it will not fight you back. That is the condition of the Muslims. We will be eating according to this prophecy. We will be ripped apart and none of us will come to aid his brother. So one of them said, Awa min qillati yawma eidin ya Rasulullah. O Messenger of Allah, is this happening to us because we are few in numbers? But the Messenger of Allah said, La, no. He said, rather you are so many, 2.2 billions. But the Messenger of Allah said, Walakinnahum, but they are ghutha ka ghutha is same. Have you ever watched a water after a rain, a water coming from high point, you know, running, a stream of water running, and on top of that water, you have brownish, dirty, dusty, you know, foam, literally traveling on the top of that running water. And that foam has no authority over itself. It just goes with the water. And look, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the description is so precise. Even the foam is not clean. It's a ghutha. It's useless, useless. If the water stops, it will stop. If the water moves, it will move. It goes left, it will go left. If it goes right, it will go right. Subhanallah, it seems that Rasulullah was describing Muslim nation in the United Nations summit. When the West or the world, rest of the world go left, we go left. If they go right, we go right. If they stop, we stop. If they say we, we attack, we attack. If they say we retreat, we retreat. 2.2. And we don't even come to help one another. The Prophet wasallam, in a distance of a month, the enemy, if they learn that the Messenger of Allah considering that direction, they used to be afraid in a distance of a month. But now, the Messenger of Allah said, and Allah will take the fear, the mahaba, the respect from the heart of your enemy. So when an enemy of Islam wants to do something to Islam, they have no respect, no regard. They kill Iraqi children, no respect. They destroyed Libya, no respect. Killing women and children, raping women in Iraq, Libya, Syria, everything that they want to do and they have no consideration of your feelings and my feelings and my strength and your strength because Allah took that from their hearts. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَلَا يَقْذِفَنَّ أَوْ يَجْعَلَنَّ الْوَهْنَ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ أَوَ الْوَهْنَ يَجْعَلَنَّ الْوَهْنَ قُلْنَا وَمَا الْوَهْنُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ We said, what is الْوَهْنَ? قَالَ حُبِّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَاهِيَةِ الْمَوْتِ See this wah, it's two things. Love of this dunya and hate of death. We all hate death. But what it means here, to die for a purpose. See, when you are so much engaged and indulged in this dunya, you don't want to leave. It means you are allowing yourself to be a coward. You don't want to die. You don't want to die for something that you have value for. It has value in your heart. That means you not willing to do what it is necessary for you to move forward. I want to read some of the prophecy that shows al-wahn in the society, in the community. The Prophet wasallam he said, If my ummah made five things acceptable, then wait at damaru alayhim. He said, the day that Muslims start cursing each other. That's number one. And they start consuming alcohol. And you can see Muslim country, 100% alcohol is allowed. And they wear silk and they listen to young lady singing music and men are happy with men and women are happy with women and a man being with men i hope you guys understand all of these five things are things that will distract you from the actual goal 
It is something that will distract you. That your life, your death, everything belongs to Allah. It's something that will distract you to uplift this deen to the way that Allah wanted. What I want to remind you all of is, yes, there's a way, but also a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, until the end of time, they would be a group from my ummah will stand for the haqq, for the truth, and they will never be defeated until the day of judgment. So in spite of all that darkness, in spite of all the parting of the kuffar, all the parting of the non-Muslims against Islam, there will always be members of this ummah who will always show the nation that is the light, that is the book of Allah, that is the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I left you on a plain, clear path. And the messenger of Allah also said, if you hold on the book of Allah and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will never go straight. So to overcome all this, to overcome all this fitna, hold on to the book of Allah and follow the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.